in the series, the series called Women Who Rock. And it features tonight's, uh, tonight's rocker is Patrice Banks. Now we're very fortunate to have Patrice here with us tonight because she just flew in from Hollywood and she's leaving us tomorrow, going back to Hollywood. She's there because she's filming a pilot for Patty's Garage, which is being produced by um, an actress who may be familiar to you, Elizabeth Banks. If she rings a bell, if you're a fan like I was of the 40-year-old virgin, or more recently, um, Hunger Games. Uh, and thank you, Pitch Perfect, how could I forget her masterpiece? She actually shares the same last name as Patrice, but I don't think there's a relation. Wonderful, good, good to know. We, we, can, we won't say anything about that. Patrice is not only here to deliver this great lecture, our season's distinguished lecture, but she's also signing immediately after the lecture, through the doors directly behind you that you came in through, copies of her wildly popular book, Girl Auto, Girls Auto Clinic Glove Box Guide. And I flipped through it, I already walked away with some tips, and I know this is gonna be incredibly helpful for everyone, so if you wanna continue the experience immediately after the lecture, she'll be signing copies just outside those doors. And by the way, if we haven't met before, I'm sorry, I'm Rich Asty. I'm the incredibly proud director of the McNay Art Museum, which 90 years ago, this very year, began as a home. So when you enter this campus, you actually entered the former home of another woman, another visionary woman like Patrice, the first woman who rocked on our campus, our founder, Marion Kugler McNay. Now, Marianne was an artist from Ohio. She's not from here. She was formally trained as an artist at the Art Institute of Chicago, but she came to Texas for love, and she visited on that first trip San Antonio during her first marriage, staying right next to the Alamo at the Menger Hotel, which is still there today. And after that marriage, sadly ended very tragically only nine months later from an epidemic that was sweeping the nation of the Spanish flu. And after a second marriage ended back home when she returned to Ohio, that one less tragically just in a divorce, she thankfully returned here to Texas and she stayed. She stayed for her third marriage, her fourth marriage. I know, I'm not done. And her, and her fifth marriage. Uh, but it was during that third marriage we treasured she treasured the first because he was named McNay. She took his name, the love of her life. But we particularly treasure her third marriage because it was during her third that she found us. She came onto this campus and bought it with her third um, husband, and it was a goat farm. What you're on now was once a goat farm in the country. And she decided to build with that husband the finest house in all of San Antonio right here. And she then, thankfully again for us, started filling that house with works of art. And she filled um, the home with art that no one else was collecting anywhere in Texas. Her focus was on leading international artists of the day, including Picasso and Matisse, Gauguin, and Vincent van Gogh. And why did she focus on the best of modern and contemporary European, American, and Mexican art? Because she knew, even though this wasn't home, that San Antonio and Texas deserved a global destination for modern art. So that's exactly what happened. Four years after she passed away, we honored her legacy when we opened in 1954, very proudly as the first modern art museum in the entire state of Texas. And I'm thrilled to say that we've been shattering glass ceilings on her behalf and redefining the art museum experience ever since. Now for the last 23 years of our 65 year history as a museum, we've invited pioneers like Mrs. McNay onto this goat farm to help us shatter more glass ceilings and embrace the future before anyone could even envision it. And this series, which has helped us get there, was made possible thanks to the generous support of Lewis and Francis Wagner. And for decades, this series has welcomed many women who rock to this goat farm including Academy Award-winning costume designer Jenny Beaven, New York Times art critic Roberta Smith, curator of the Prado Museum in Madrid, Leticia Ruiz Gomez, and just recently, last fall, if you were here, feminist artist activist, the Gorilla Girls. But this season, we laser focus on women who are taking our country to new heights at the McNay with a series, Women Who Rock, and we're featuring three trailblazers in their respective fields. First, for this immediate season, was artist activist and educator Judy Baca, if you were here to hear her, from Los Angeles. More recently, Tony-nominated scenic designer Anna Luisos, and tonight, a dynamic pioneer in every way, Patrice Banks. 
Now, when planning the current exhibition on view directly above us, that's the inspiration for the lecture, American Dreams, Classic Cars and Postwar Paintings, the curators, including Kate Carey, our head of education, and Jackie Edwards, assistant curator, and Renee Barrio, our head of curatorial affairs, wanted to highlight the role of women, women creatives, who had been largely underrepresented in the auto industry in terms of design and leadership. They found this through their research. And we made that same commitment, not only to the cars and the story about the cars upstairs, but also to the paintings that decorate the walls, all 25 of them in the same space. Which is why when you go upstairs, you not only find the 10 classic cars, but also paintings by Judith Godwin, Edna Andrade, Dorothy Hood, Grace Hardigan, and Joan Mitchell. The exhibition galleries upstairs are open after the lecture, by the way, for you to take in even more of the show. Now, in fact, the time that we opened the museum in the mid-1950s, our curators found during their research that the great Harley Earl, the head of styling of General Motors in Detroit, had empowered a first all-female design team for his um, great creations. He cited both women's aesthetic and purchasing power as a model for the company's growth and innovation. But let's go back to why we're here tonight, and that's Patrice Banks, who is here to build on that legacy today, 65 years later. She was the first in her family to attend college, graduating with a degree in engineering, so that alone is very impressive. But after obtaining that degree, she went even further back to school for automotive technology, and at the same time, as if that wasn't enough, she decided to build her company. And she's now opened a full-service auto repair shop with women mechanics that's accompanied by a hair and nail salon. I know, amazing, amazing. She's committed, if it isn't clear enough by now, she's very committed to empowering women through their cars, but also encouraging women to pursue non-traditional roles in life which is why she is the absolute perfect person to conclude our series, Women Who Rock, and the right person to honor the legacy of our founder, Marion Kugler McNay. So before we welcome Patrice for the first time to the McNay stage, I direct you to the screen directly behind me. People don't expect a female mechanic. I get some flack from people in the automotive industry about wearing heels, about being a mechanic, because they don't think I look like a mechanic or I talk like a mechanic. But I know that that's my strength. I'm being authentic. I'm not trying to be sexy with my heels. It's just who I am. I like to wear heels, but I also work on cars. I always felt taken advantage of by mechanics. I thought I needed a guy to help me. And I'm an empowered woman. I was an engineer, I owned a house, and I wanted to find education and resources that were gonna empower me to make the right choice with my car. And I couldn't find them. So I was searching for a female mechanic, and the first thing that pops up, women, next to the muscle cars and the bikinis. So I thought, why not go back to school, learn how to work on cars, and create a business that was gonna cater to women. Girls Auto Clinic is a full service auto repair shop with five women mechanics that work here and a nail salon to get your nails done while you wait for your car. We get many women that want to learn how to change a tire or even change their oil. So we post free car care workshops that's going to teach you how to take care of your car. That's finally a place they can bring their car and they no longer feel like they're going to be taken advantage of. It's scary to step up to the edge and then throw yourself off. And I tell people every day, I don't know what I'm doing, but nobody knows what they're doing, right? It's about having the confidence to put yourself out there, especially if I want to create something that's going to be meaningful. There's definitely days where I want to quit and I'm on the verge of crying, you know, or even crying like, I don't want to do that, you know, like a little kid, like it gets that bad. But my nieces are looking up to me. You know, how can I be a better example for them? I want them to have a bold life. I want them to have a courageous life. And so I need to be bold and I need to be courageous. Now when you look for a female mechanic, Girls Auto Clinic pops up first. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. 
Makes you want lean cuisine, right? <laughs> I actually eat lean cuisine. When they came to me and they said, hey, you want to be in a commercial? It's like, what's this have to do with cars? But I'm learning by being here, too, that a lot has to do with it and just sharing stories about empowering women. Um, so I have a confession to make. I want everyone to know that I am not a car enthusiast. I'm really not even into classic cars or get excited about that. So when you start talking about turbos and horsepower, um, I'm kind of like, okay. Uh, it, or these classic cars, which are beautiful, but I don't really know a lot about them. I can't spit out gear, make and models or anything like that. In fact, I called myself an auto airhead, but more on that later. Um, so when I got the call about coming to speak here um, at an art museum, I thought, well, that's interesting. It's not something I've done before, and I didn't really see the connection. So I talked to Kate, who had reached out, and she was telling me about this American Dreams exhibit and what it represented to them and why they decided to do it, and I thought it was really interesting. So I thought to myself, okay, how can I incorporate me, my story, cars, artwork? I didn't think I was an artist. Again, I'm not a car enthusiast. Um, what am I going to talk about? So I started thinking about it, uh, investigating, reflecting on my life a little bit more, a lot, journaling, and I realized um, that I actually am an artist. I've always been an artist. I think we all have been, in fact, we're born artists, and we're kind of trained out of our creativity and our art, because what really is an artist but someone who is pursuing their passion and their purpose authentically, right, um, to shift perspectives in the world. And I believe that's what I do every day with Girls Auto Clinic, um, and it's what I've done with my life. And so this is my auto airhead artist story. Um, so my name is Patrice Banks. Like I said, I grew up in right outside of Philadelphia, Phoenixville. I did come from um, a very underprivileged home. There was a lot of violence and abuse and drugs in my home. My mom was a, a single parent, um, did not even graduate from high school. I was the first to graduate from high school and go to college. It was really important to me to have an education. In fact, my mom would say, your education is a ticket to a better life. And I just ingrained that in my head um, very young in what I wanted to do. We didn't even have a car growing up, actually. We walked everywhere. And the first person to have a car in the house was me when I turned 16. I thought, I'm tired of walking. Um, a car meant freedom. It meant me getting out of an abusive home, uh, getting a job, pursuing more in terms of my education. So I thought my car was actually a symbol for me and freedom and to better myself. So I worked three jobs and I had my own insurance and my own car when I was in high school and then went on to college to be an engineer, which I really liked being an engineer because I love to solve problems. But one thing that I tell people is I never felt smart as an engineer. Uh, I don't know if it's from my background, I'm also a minority um, and a woman, and I went to Lehigh University, surrounded by a bunch of men, and after Lehigh, I went to work for DuPont for 12 years as an engineer, and was surrounded by some very intelligent um, men that I worked with. I was the only woman, the only minority in my group, uh, and I learned a lot, but what I tell people is I never felt smart or intelligent, which is a mistake, and I didn't realize that until I started Girls Auto Clinic. And I was in my office one day, uh, being an engineer, and an auto airhead, like I said, um, looking to get my oil changed. And me and my girlfriend, we used to go to this specific Jiffy Lube near our job because there was a nail salon next to it. And we would go and we would eat lunch, we would eat our, I swear, we would eat our Lean Cuisines in my office, then we would go get our car changed at Jiffy, our oil changed at Jiffy Lube and walked next door to get our nails done. And we thought we were just so smart, right? Getting all this stuff, multitasking on our lunch break, um, right? So it, I didn't realize at this time it was foreshadowing um, a business idea that I was going to have. And so while I was an engineer, I, I said I felt like an auto airhead. I hated my automotive experiences. I don't know how many women in here would identify as an auto airhead, but to me that meant I waited to the last minute to get repairs or maintenance done. Right? I always thought I needed a guy to help me with my car to understand it, even as an engineer. Um, anytime a check engine light or a dashboard light would pop up, I'd panic. Right? And, and it wasn't a very empowering position to be in as a woman and an engineer. I hated all of my automotive experiences. And as I started looking into it a little bit more, I, I realized women actually also 
my friends and just in general hate their automotive experiences. I was talking to my girlfriends about it. They felt like auto airheads. And I started just asking random women about their experiences. And the statistics say that actually 77% believe that women are taken advantage of or, or mistreated by the automotive industry which I thought was a little bit insane because I also found out that women are the number one customer in the automotive industry. Did you know that? So there are women that influence up to 95% of car buying decisions because we know that we're the CFOs of the household. So if we want the car, we're getting the car, right? If not, we're not getting it unless our, uh, you know, the husband's gone through a midlife crisis and doesn't tell us. 67% um, of auto repairs women. And actually, since 2012, there are more women now that hold driver's licenses than men across all age groups. I know that scares some of you guys to know that there's a lot more women out there on the road. But it's here, right? The future's female. So to me, this didn't make sense, right? Women spend $200 billion a year buying and repairing their car. Why are we at such a disadvantage? Why do we feel like auto airheads? Why do we hate our experiences? And being a problem solver that I am, and someone who likes to think that I'm creative, I, I came up with the solution that the reason that we have so few women loving their experiences when we spend so much money in this industry is because there are not women working in this industry. We're not interfacing with women when we take our cars in for repairs. We're not buying cars from women when we go to get a brand new car or a used car. You don't have many women engineers, women designers, um, and we're the number one customer. That was insane. No wonder we're hating our experiences. So I thought I have to do something about this, right? I never meant to be a mechanic. I'm an engineer, I have a good career, I'm making great money. I'm not, I'm not trying to own a shop, right? So I, like the video said, I start Googling female mechanic. I'm gonna find a female mechanic. She's gonna help me. I thought I'll blog tips and ideas for women and I'm gonna help ed educate myself, educate other women. But as you can see, when I type in female mechanic, I couldn't find one. I could not find a female mechanic. And it's crazy to think that now I've got five. I'll tell you how I found all of my mechanics. But at the time, I couldn't find a female mechanic. And I thought, well, I guess it's got to be me. I'm going to go back to school, and I'm going to learn how to work on cars so I can empower myself, educate myself, and then share it with women because we're the number one customer in this industry and there's nothing worse than not feeling good about how you spend your money, not being sure if you really needed that repair or if you're being charged the right amount. I know I used to leave the repair center so many times thinking, did I really need that? I wasn't sure and it really just depended on my mood that day if I accepted a recommendation or I turned it down like you're not getting me today. <laughs> I didn't really know what was going on. So in 2012, I go back to school I'm 31, 32, the only girl in class with a bunch of 19-year-olds, right? And I'm scared. Remember I tell you I don't feel smart as an engineer at DuPont? And here I am again, this woman who has an engineering degree. I was a manager at DuPont. I'd come after work snazzy in my heels and my, my blouse and, and slacks, and I'm intimidated by 19-year-old boys. Why? Because I never touched a tool in my life. And I found myself while I was in class, I was loving the information. It was finally clicking like, oh, this isn't rocket science. I can't wait to share this information with women. But when we got out into the shop and I started using tools that I've never touched before, I found myself stepping back, um, you know, making myself smaller, asking the guys for help. Can you come help me do this? And they'd push me out of the way and they would just do it and I'd stand there and watch. And I realized like this is one of the problems that not just in male-dominated fields, but just women have is the confidence to step up, to ask questions and not be afraid to make a mistake, and to learn. And I realized I was doing it to myself. How am I going to educate women on how to do this when I can't do it for myself or empower women in this field when I can't find the empowerment myself? And so I had to switch the thinking in my head and not be afraid and say, I don't care if I mess up. I don't care what these people think. I don't care what the guys think, if they think I'm stupid, if they think I'm crazy, right, um, in what I'm doing, because I'm on a mission. And if they're not here to help me, they're in my way, and they can get out of my way. So I stopped being afraid to make mistakes, and I started being more aggressive and bold in what I wanted to learn and the things that I was working on in cars. I started working for free at a repair center uh, just so I could learn, and I started doing my workshops while I was still in school. My first car care workshop I did, I was still in school. And I cut that day to go give a workshop at a sorority at the University of Delaware. 
And I'm glad that I did because it went over so well. And then two months later, I started doing them every single month. And that was in what, 2015? And it's 2019 and we still host workshops every single month, haven't missed one, um, and they are free. And it has been my core value to offer these car care workshops for free. Um, education should be free to me, to everyone, especially information like this that you can find everywhere on the internet, but just the way it's being delivered. And I wanted to give women the opportunities to come into a, what I call a safe space. I know that's like a cliche word right now, but it is a safe space where they don't have to feel ashamed or embarrassed about how they've treated their car or, and what they've done to it in the past. They can come and ask questions. There is no stupid question. I hate when people start a question with, I know this is a stupid question. I always tell them, no, it's not, right? We're here to learn. You know, the, if you're thinking it in your head, it's something that you should be asking and want to know. So our workshops are wildly popular. And like I said, they're free. And I get a lot of slack for making them free. Um, I've done some business competitions because of Girls Auto Clinic, the business is kind of rare. Um, before I even opened my shop, I was telling people, I'm going to open a repair center with female mechanics that's going to have a nail salon to get your nails done while you wait for your car. Every workshop I would tell people this. I didn't have a female mechanic, I didn't have a shop, I didn't have the money. I gave a TED talk entitled, How I Plan on Disrupting the Automotive Industry in My Red Heels. Very bold, right? I didn't know what I was doing. Like I said, I didn't know what I was doing. I believed in myself. I had a dream, and I believed in this solution to my problem. And I also believed in women, not just myself, but I believed in women, and that we deserve to be in this space, um, and that we need to be in this space. The automotive industry needs us here if we're your number one customer. Um, so I started doing these business competitions, telling everyone, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to empower women. And I got so, from so many people like Damon John and Tyra Banks and other VCs and executives, you need to charge for your workshops because they thought that was my only way to be making money. And I said, no, they're going to be free always. I was looking at it as it's my cost to get a customer. So when I opened my repair center in 2017, in January, guess what? I had already done over 30, 40 workshops. There was thousands of people who already knew who I was and what I was doing, and we had over 1,000 customers in our first month because of that. And so I thought it was kind of genius. They may not have seen it at that, at that point. But they also told me that they thought that I should be like a, they wanted me to be like a one-woman show. Don't do the repair centers. At the time, I had my workshops. They were going well. I had a self-published version of the glove box guide. And that really just came about because the workshops were so good with a lot of information. But it's, you don't always remember it, right? It's the 80-20 rule. You only retain about 20%. And so a lot of women were asking if they could get some notes and things that they could take home. And so my published, first self-published book, I did in PowerPoint. <laughs> and I printed it out at Kinko's and handed it out to people so they could keep it in their glove box and write notes from the workshop. And so people who weren't in the Philadelphia area could also get this information. And so while I was pitching my idea, looking to maybe raise money to start a shop, um, I got the, well, they saw me as like a Bethany Frankel, like a one-woman show. Don't do the repair centers. It's too much money. It's too complicated. You're not going to find female mechanics. But one of the things that I understood about the automotive industry and the lack of women in it and the reason that we are so dissatisfied is because there weren't opportunities for women. And I, and I would say to them, I didn't start this business. I didn't quit my job at DuPont to be a one woman show about this, you know, like a Rachel Ray or Bethany Frankel. I'm doing this to provide opportunities for women, right? So we have more women in this industry. That's the only way that we're gonna solve this problem. And so that's always been the goal for me. Even today, when I'm doing all these other things, like writing a book and doing this TV show, how does it create opportunities for women in the motive industry? That's the most important thing because that's what I'm here to do. That's my core value with this business. So yeah, I, I started doing these workshops and I was doing them for free and they picked up. They were fabulous, a lot of really great information. I did a couple Instagram stories um, for you guys with some tips about cars. I think you'll love them, check them out. Um, and obviously the book has got some really, really great tips in there. Um, like what's the most important thing you can do for your car, the biggest mistakes we make, do I really need that oil change, do I need that air filter. Jiffy Lube would sell me every time I went right? Th that type of information. 
Um, and so the workshops were going well. The book, I started picking up a little bit of press. I don't have a PR person. People just loved the idea. They loved how bold I was. They loved the red heels. I was even asked that question earlier, why, why the red heels? Where do they come from? And I get a lot of slack. Like they said, in the automotive industry, people think that I do this just to be sexy. Like it's a purposeful thing to gain attraction. Look at me, I'm a sexy mechanic, um, which is not the case. I'm just the woman who likes to wear heels. In fact, the story around how these heels came about was I was in class one night after um, working for DuPont. I had to wear heels and slacks and a blouse, and I didn't have a change of clothes. And I wasn't going home to get a change of clothes because I didn't have time. And I thought, I'm not going to miss out on this lab. And we were taking starters out um, that day and learning all about starters and alternators. And I didn't want to miss it because I wasn't going to learn. And so I threw on a hoodie and got underneath the car and was pulling out a starter. And all you saw were my legs coming out and heels. And I took it, somebody snapped a picture. I put it on Facebook and it was the most liked picture I'd ever gotten at the time. And so when I came to think about how to do a logo, right, or what is, you know, what is gonna be appealing, um, the red heels came back. Everybody loved them and they thought this is great, especially women who are my number one customer, who I am here for. I tell people Girls Auto Clinic isn't an automotive company, we're a female empowerment company, I'm here for women. And so when I get slack about the red heels, I say, I look like my customer. I'm not trying to look like a mechanic, right? I'm being myself, I'm being authentic Patrice, which is something that I've always done, is that I've always been really great at, is being an authentic Patrice. In fact, that's what I'm really an expert in, is just being authentic, speaking from my heart like I do today, like I do on the videos. Um, and that's kind of where I feel like I'm saying that I'm an artist. And that's where the shoes came about, just me being authentic and people love it and they get it. My feet don't. <laughs> um, I wear them during my workshops and when I do this stuff, I don't wear heels when I work on cars. Um, but I don't work on cars that much anymore because I run the business. So, so yeah, so I, I had a lot of people tell me where they thought I should go with this business, what they wanted me to do, mostly men, where they, they, what they think I couldn't have done. And I didn't listen to them. I had no money, and I was not accepting any money if, because it, if it wasn't a part of my core value. And it's still that way today. When I talk to people like Pep Boys um, and other big brands about working with them, I, I'm a little bold. Again, I'm very bold <laughs> in what I say. Um, I tell them, I'm not jumping on your train. You're jumping on mine. You have to get on mine. You have to be following what my core values are, what we're trying to do, and believe in that mission and vision. And anybody that wants to work with us in the automotive industry or anywhere can, like people like Elizabeth Banks when she found out about me. And I'll, I'll tell you that story, how that came to pass. Because like I said, I wasn't intending on being an author, being a public speaker, being on TV. I have no PR person. All this press comes to us because it's unique, because I'm being authentic, because I'm speaking using my voice. I'm, I'm speaking about something that's important, that's necessary, about women making their contribution. And people want to hear it. I, I wasn't planning on you know, having all of this craziness around the business. It was really just, how can I provide opportunities for women? And I believe I can do that by providing these resources, services, and products. Um, and that's what our mission is. Girls Auto Clinic's mission is to provide automotive buying and repair resources, services, and products to women. And those resources are things like my workshop, the book, I also have a Facebook group I call the Shecanic Facebook page. And the Shecanic is the name I came up with for my car savvy ladies. Um, you look at Lady Gaga, she's got the, the little monsters, and Rihanna has her navy, and Beyonce has the beehive. I thought, I need a name for my following, for these women who are becoming empowered, who are learning about their cars. They're inspiring other women by doing this. And that's where we came about the Shecanics. And so that's what I call my car savvy ladies, um, you know, going from an auto airhead to a Shecanic. And we have a Facebook group for you ladies. Sorry, guys. It's just women with women drivers and female mechanics. Ask any question you have about your car. Share a story about a buyer beware or a triumph that you've had with your car. It's really empowering to see so many women talking about their cars in a real way and then helping each other with any problems that they may have. So these are some of the resources that we have that we obviously would love to grow. It's one of my missions with Girls Auto Clinic to reach every woman driver. And I did an interview with Terry Gross on NPR. Anybody here fresh air? 
Oh my goodness, so I had no idea who she was. I never listened to Terry Gross. And apparently she's really big. And NPR had did a couple interviews with them because it, it was more of like the local news with um, you know, the, the local public broadcasting station, WHYY in Philadelphia. So they had me go down to the studio to do this interview and it's the third time I've been there to do an interview and it was all like local stuff so I'm thinking it's not a big deal. So, you know, kicking my feet back, relaxing, like, let's do this. I'm very chill, loosey-goosey. And, you know, Terry Gross is very low and slow. And I'm used to, like, Good Morning America, right? Up and, and you're talking and excitement and energy. And so it was a very low and slow interview. And I'm thinking, that sucked. <laughs> I walked out of it like, that kind of sucked. But I'm like, nobody's going to hear it. It's no big deal, right? And I start talking to a friend of mine, and she's like, Terry Gross? Are you kidding? Do you know how big she is? She's interviewed presidents. I, I couldn't sleep for the, like the next three days because <laughs> I thought this was the most horrible interview. It's going to be crazy. It's going to come out, and people are going to hear it. I'm like, this girl's nuts. But in fact, when it did come out, it, it was an amazing interview because I was authentic. I was loosey-goosey. You could, if I knew who she was, I'd be nervous. I probably wouldn't have answered in the way that I did. I spoke really openly about my past um, and coming from an abusive family, um, how I got out of that, and, and where I found my passion for women's empowerment from. Um, and so it was a really great interview. And Elizabeth Banks heard it. Not just Elizabeth Banks, a couple of people in Hollywood heard it because they listen to Terry Gross apparently for ideas for TV shows. And I got three offers actually to create a TV show about my business. Um, and I went with Elizabeth Banks because I love her and her following is more around our following, right? Our key market. Again, I'm not trying to have a TV show. I'm trying to create opportunities for women. And so if I want to create opportunities for women, I need a powerhouse like Elizabeth Banks who's creating opportunities for women, right? To partner with me. And so the name of the show is Patty's Auto, and Fox picked it up. Right now we are shooting on the Warner Brothers Studios um, in Burbank. So cool to be on, see a stage, right, that's got real lifts and a garage and women that are working on cars and talking about cars in a real way and just what women face, not just in the automotive industry but in male-dominated fields. Um, the reason that's important, I talk to you about my girls a lot, the girls that work for me. I'm so proud of them, and this actually is, when people ask me what I'm most proud about with Girls Auto Clinic, I talk about them all the time. I tell you I couldn't find a female mechanic, and I didn't have to find these girls. They all found me. When I started doing these workshops, I'd get a little bit of press about the book, about the workshops. Somebody would share it on social media, or they would send um, one of these girls an email and say, look who I found. And they would show up, they'd call me, they'd email me, they'd come to a workshop and say, I love what you're doing. I've always wanted to do this. I love working on cars. But none of them were working on cars at the time that they found me. They all had their stories of discrimination, harassment, being laid off or fired because they were women, um, you know, got pregnant so they couldn't work anymore. And it, Anyone that works in a male-dominated field knows how difficult it is to usually be the only one, because usually they are the only one. And they have to fight for you know, the respect that they deserve. And they have to fight to get a good career path and just to do anything to learn and to make their contribution. So most of them quit, and they go into a different profession. And that's the case with these women. One was a stay-at-home mom. The other one was like a substitute teacher. Um, and they came to me and said, this is, this is our dream. We want to work for you. And I'm like, yes, this is what it's about. I want to create an opportunity. And one thing that I realized when they came to me, these, all this, every single tech that works for me came to me. I did not go out looking for them. Is that there are women out here that want to work on cars. There are women who are looking for this opportunity. right? They don't know where to start. Most of them are like, where do I start? I don't know how to open a shop. And so it made me feel so confident in what I was doing, confident in women. Um, that they can do this and that there's going to be women out there because that's what I get a lot when I pitch my business. Oh, there's not women who want to work on cars. And yes, there is, right? There's, they may not be coming right out of high school. They may be in their 20s and 30s. I get emails from women who are in their 50s saying, I always wanted to work on cars. When I was younger, my dad told me I couldn't. I was discouraged and it was always in me and I just did something else. But now, Forget it, I'm 50, my dad's not around, I wanna learn, I'm going back to school. I think that's the coolest thing. It inspires me. It inspires me when I see a woman who's 
following her passion, who's right, telling people, no, I'm not going to be what you think I should be. I'm going to do what I want to do, what I believe in, what I'm passionate about, and I'm going to do it in my heels <laughs> right, if I want to. And so I'm really proud of my girls. Um, they come to work every day. Sometimes they wear heels. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have on makeup. Sometimes they don't. Right? They just are able to be themselves, make their contribution. They don't have that stress or, and pressure of messing up. Right? And there's a guy over them telling them what to do so, and, or this, they don't feel good enough. Um, you know, they, they're not afraid to make a mistake. They collaborate a lot. And they come to work very happy and excited. And that makes me feel good. And I've empowered them in their lives to leave bad relationships, right? Empowering their children. They bring their kids to work. When we have a snow day, because we're in the East Coast, or someone's sick, I say, listen, I get it. We're women. Bring your kids in. I, I understand. I'm not saying that you can. I don't want that to stop you from doing this. Like, how can we make this work? Which I think is really important if we're moving forward with Girls Auto Clinic, is how we can make this business model work for women. Because the business model for automotive repair and sales was designed by men for men and how men work and not how women work. So while these women are fabulous, it's also been a struggle, right? Trying to figure out what works for them, what works for us, and what's gonna work for other women as we expand and grow. So not just the, the resources, like I mentioned, but the repair centers. I'd love to bring one to San Antonio. I was mentioning Houston earlier because I used to live right outside of Houston, and it's a big city, everyone drives, and of course we know the ladies love to get their nails and hair done there, um, but San Antonio is a great city. I think this would do well, really, anywhere. Because, again, women are the number one driver. And there's more women drivers on the road than men. They need the service. They want to feel empowered. Um, my job is to make sure our customer feels good about their choice they made with their car. And they understand that, yes, it costs this much, and this is what I needed. You know, I want, I want women to be smart consumers and confident drivers. And that's what we do. And so hopefully we, the Chicanic brands can become a lifestyle brand. We'll identify as being a Chicanic, not just with cars, but anything in your life that requires you using your hands, using tools. I no longer want women to feel like they have to talk to their dad or their brother, um, ask a man for help, right, or feel intimidated. Or, or the story we say in our head, I'm not going to get this. I even said that as an engineer. I'm not going to understand cars. Like, how insane is that, right? And these stories that we tell ourselves that we're not going to be good at something, that we're not smart. I told you I didn't feel smart as an engineer at DuPont. When I came out into the real world, I call it the real world, because DuPont's like this bubble of just really smart engineers. And if you work for an engineering firm like that, you'll get it. When you get out into the real world around other people, I realized I'm really smart. I was working with some men that were executives making a ton of money that I'm like running circles around. And I told myself, I'm no longer going to feel intimidated. Um, how important it is, not just for me, but women in general, to be here, to be in these spaces, making our contributions, making our voices be heard. They need us. I tell the automotive industry, you need me, right? They're, they are struggling to get in front of their number one customer. They try with marketing, right? Um, all these other tricks, usually just marketing, to, to, to figure out how they can engage their female or their woman customer, and they're not successful, right? And I'm saying, I have women's attention. I've got women's attention. You guys need women's attention. You need to understand your number one driver more and what, and what that she wants and what she needs when it comes to a car. And not just cars today, but cars for the future. So some of the people that I'm working with are Waymo, Google X. I've spoken with them and done workshops with them. Self-driving cars and all this technology is being designed by men. If women, if the future's female and we're the number one driver and it's only getting more women drivers, why are we having the technology and the cars of the future being designed by men? Are they gonna work for us? Are we gonna be happy with our experiences? Probably not. So talking about the importance of making sure that women are involved in all of these aspects of the industry um, from design down to repair and that's what girls auto clinic plans on doing um, opening other repair centers across the country getting our resources out to more women uh, using this show like patty's auto which will hopefully be airing in the fall we haven't gotten the okay yet but everyone at fox is loving it um, and it's really really authentic which makes me really happy um, so hopefully it'll be airing in september but this information, um, getting it out to women, and just being able to inspire girls to say, I can do that. I want them to see me, see the girls working at my shop, 
and see the girls on TV on Patty's Auto and say, I want to be that person. I can be that person, not just something to strive to be. You can be this person now. I tell everyone, I don't know how I got here. I mean, I kind of know how I got here because it's a lot of hard work and preparation, but um, and timing, right? And being in the right place at the right time. But it's also available to anyone. Not only do you all do, should be up here, you deserve to be up here, you can be up here speaking, working on your passion, right? Your purpose in life, how you're helping others, especially women, because I say we're so necessary right now in these male dominated fields that they don't see us, they don't hear, have our voices and our contribution uh, to make it better, to make cars better, to make our whole experiences better. And so that's what I hope Girls Auto Clinic can do is really just be a representation. Uh, not just to women and men, but to, you know, to men. I have a lot of customers that are male, maybe about 25% come in and we love it. We love kind of playing around with them. Uh, and they've had examples of strong women in their lives. That's why they come to us, because they know a woman can fix a car and she can probably do it better <laughs> than a man sometimes. We also get some people that look at us crazy like, you mean you do engine repairs too? Yeah. Are you, you do this, this too? Yeah. Not just oil changes, I'm like, no, we do it all, right? They're shocked almost um, to see that women are doing this. Um, so I love the pleasure uh, to be able to showcase this and to highlight and represent what women are capable of doing, what these women that work in my shop are capable of doing. And these aren't super educated women that have engineering degrees like me, right? They, some of them just have high school diplomas, right? Or they have a technical degree and they're raising their families. They're single moms, or you know, they do have a husband that's also working in a, a blue collar field, right? And so it makes me feel good to be able to say this is a viable option for women to raise your family, to empower your household. I love when they bring their kids in because I want their kids to see this is what a female mechanic looks like. I love it when our customers bring their kids in, men and women. This is what a mechanic looks like. This is what we're capable of doing. Of course, the nail salon, right, is there. Um, and that's more just an added factor for fun. And also, to give women something to look forward to. I hate taking my car in, right? It's a chore. Even if I know what I'm doing, it's still a chore. I don't enjoy it. It's something you usually give to your husband to do, right? I'll take the car in for me. Um, but now it's something I look forward to do because I can get my nails done. I know I'm going to be in a place I feel comfortable, that I'm respected, that I'm not going to be hit on <laughs> by someone, right? Um, and just a space for me. And that's what's most important, I think, um, as we are growing as women and to our careers and we are becoming more empowered and we are changing the face of just America, the American dream, but also the world. And I hope to do that with Girls Auto Clinic. So that's my auto airhead art, artist story. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd love to take some questions. I can ask, answer questions about anything. You have a question about car, you have a question about business, you have a question about me, how I started, my text. I love answering questions. So please, um, no stupid questions, like I said. I'm open to everything. Where'd you get your shoes? Anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> will you, will you, I, uh, yes. Patrice, uh, here in San Antonio, we have a lot of great high schools. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of great high schools here where they have vocational, you know, car mechanics, stuff like that. And uh, about a week ago, I was listening to TV and they were talking about getting women interested in computer technology because they're low there too. Do you have any ideas about what schools can do to try and get girls interested in going into auto mechanics? Yes, I love this question because I, I get it a lot, not just from schools, but from corporations too. I spoke at Caterpillar's Women in Leadership Conference and I was talking with some of the people in their C-suite, their CEO, and they're like, how do we recruit women? How do we recruit women? And I tell them, stop recruiting women, right? You need to figure out how to keep women in the positions they're in now. Because the issue with like all the girls that I that work for me, they're all mechanics. They went to school for it, they worked in it, and they had these problems, and they leave and they go into a different profession. You won't have to recruit women if you have women working in it, and they're making their contribution and they're happy. So it's figuring out how do we keep women in these roles, and it's not by hiring one woman and saying I'm diverse. We want to make our executive suite diverse, so we're going to hire one woman, right? She's still going to struggle. 
because often they don't listen to her ideas, they don't listen to her voice, they don't think she knows what she's talking about. It needs to be more than one girl or one woman. It's got to be even where it's 50-50 or a majority women. But what that means is that we probably have to change the way we work because these business models were designed for how men work, not how women work. And that's one of the things that we're learning. So it's not just as easy as saying, well, we're going to hire a woman and put her in here. And it's not just as easy as saying, well, we're going to recruit young girls. Because guess what? Yeah, well, girls are interested in this stuff. When I went to Lehigh for engineering, it was 50-50 women girls. My, that, it was the first time Lehigh had that, because it used to be an all-male school. But when you start looking at where we go in our careers, women don't stay in STEM. Same thing even with lawyers. When you go to law school, it's 50-50 women and men. But when you look at law firms and whose partners, it's all men, it's not a lot of women, right? So part of me believes that the reason that we're not able to excel as great as we can in our career is because the business models were designed for men. Example, kids are sick, right? I had one week, it was a tough week, last month. One of my texts was on vacation. Another one was home, migraine and cramps. I get it, I'm a woman, I get it. The other lady, her, her um, son was sick with strep throat. So now we're scrambling, like, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make this work? And I had uh, one of my mentors as a man, and he said, this is why they don't hire women in the automotive industry, right? And it, it kind of upset me, but it also lit me on fire, because I was saying, because these business models are designed by men, right? Women usually have a lot of this unpaid labor, right, of taking care of the kids in the home, and that doesn't mean that I don't value them. It doesn't mean that we can't make a viable business with women as the main staff and still turn a profit. We have to just create new ways of doing it um, because I know women are capable, right, and that um, we're worthy. So that's one of the things I talk about. Um, girls are interested in this stuff, and it, it's usually when they get into it, right, that they don't have the support that they need. So really it's about representation, and then how do we change these business models to make it work when we do hire these women, and it can't just be about hiring one. So thanks for that question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think I'm loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I am a data scientist right now, and I'm definitely not an airhead and not a machine mechanic because I do look into what is the problem. And, and I do know this, it's all over my head. I don't want the grip strings. I don't want the patients dealing with it. And, but it seems I also work with the uh, animal colleges. I was wondering, do you work or consider working with the trade school to try to get like, internships in for women? Mm -hmm. Or try to get with the high schools. Yes. So I do, I'm, because of, I do speaking, and unfortunately I can't do as much as I get requests to do, because a lot of times it is at high schools and technical schools, and I love talking to kids, actually more than adults, no offense. <laughs> um, I do love talking to kids. Um, but I don't have the opportunity because I'm still running the business. But one of the things that I want to do is we, we have interns for the summer. Um, we hired one last summer, but I'd like to be able to get in more women, but we, our, our shop is small, which is why I'm starting to expand our workshops. So if you can't, um, we don't have an opportunity for you to work on cars, you could still be teaching women about cars, using your knowledge and what you know. And you don't have to be, um, have years of experience. I started teaching my workshops in school, so I look for women who are in school that want to make some extra money while they're learning about cars, right, to teach these workshops. And then as we start expanding the repair centers, I'd love to hire them in more as interns. So I go to the technical schools and talk a lot. Um, I talk to the girls, um, try to see how they're really feeling about automotive, if it's what they want to get into, because you don't always have to get into turning wrenches, you can get into other things, service advisors, parts, that kind of stuff, and figuring out how we can make it work um, in the, my business somewhere, whether it's doing workshops, writing blogs, one of them writes blogs for me and does our social media, it's just being able to create an opportunity in this field um, while they're still learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm interested in the idea of apprenticeships, and have, has that been something that you've explored, having 
people, can women come into your, your business and be an apprentice to somebody who's already an expert? Yeah, we're always open to that. We had, like I said, we, last summer we did one, but we have a really small shop. I only have three bays. And so we don't always have the opportunity to invite more than one person at a time. And because of the way the school's set up, it's usually only in the summer. So every summer we do apprenticeships, which I think is super important, and I always talk about that. I told you um, my first job, actually. So um, I started apprenticing when I was still in school. I was working for free um, because I didn't know anything at a shop. I said, I went to actually three places and said, I'm willing to work for free. I just want to learn how to work on cars. I went to like a dealership and a couple mom and pop shops. Um, I'll, whatever my skills are, I'll give for free. I'm an engineer, I'm in management, I can do marketing, I can help you. And I was turned down by three people before the fourth one said yes. One of them thought I was gonna take their customers. Um, another one's wife didn't want me working in the shop. <laughs> um, another guy just didn't think I was good enough. The for the first one to say yes was a guy named Edwin, and he had a place called Guy's Auto Clinic. I didn't, I didn't have a name yet. I didn't have anything really, not even the workshop. I'm like, I just want to learn. And he taught me, and from there I built my business and how I got the name Girls Auto Clinic. Again, everything's super authentic, not really pre-planned. I was doing my workshops. Um, my first one was coming up after the one at Delaware, University of Delaware. And I said, what do I call this? I don't have a name yet. And he had, his sign says Guys Auto Clinic. And I had a picture of it and I crossed out the guys and I wrote girls on top. And that's how it came about. So apprenticeships are very important. I know that they are because it was something that helped me get to where I needed to get. Um, even though I only did it for a short amount of time and then the next job I got paid. Uh, which was important. Actually, he was the first one to hire me um, when I left DuPont. I, I was working for free, and um, I had this guy say, I need some help. He was having problems with his service advisor and a technician that wasn't showing up, and was like, can you help me? And it was literally a December afternoon, and the next day I went into DuPont and was like, well, I found a full-time, because I found a full-time job doing this now. I knew I was going to have to leave eventually, and that's what I did, going from like $100,000 a year to $600 under the table, which was scary. I was asked that question. It was scary. I would wake up in the middle of the night like, I just quit my job. Like, what's wrong? But I had a lot of money saved up. Please don't quit your job without having a plan. I had a lot of money saved, and it was still rough, because the shop didn't open for two years after that. But I was working, I was learning about cars, and I was building my business. And so being an apprentice is really important. I talk a lot to young kids about that. And I would love to be able to accept more. So um, we're actually working with some interns, but on the um, beauty side to help with the marketing and the business model there, um, because we have more, a little bit more opportunity. Um, so as we expand, we'll definitely be accepting more. And I talk a lot with um, LTI, Lincoln Technical Institute, and some of these technical institutes about um, working with women. I go out to the schools and meet their female techs just to talk with them and tell them, you know, how, how we can be supportive if they're not working for us, just other ways we can be supportive. Join our Shecanic group, host workshops, write a blog, and just inspiring them to do something. I am not trying to be the only one doing this, right, in terms of women. And I get that a lot, because I'm very bold and aggressive, right? So people think, well, you know, who do you think you are? But if, when I see another woman doing workshops, I'm like, yes, girl, how can I help you? What do you need? Is there any way I can promote it, right? Um, and so just inspiring other girls to just doing it themselves like I did. You don't need to have a guy to help you. You don't need a million dollars to open a shop. You just got to have a plan, right, have the passion, and get out there. I was doing workshops in parking lots, in a parking lot, anywhere. Right? Just bring your car, bring yourself, be willing to learn. And it's just that openness to learn is really, really important. And I talk a lot to kids about that. Let's have the last question here. Okay. We'll I'm sorry, I I'm sorry. rant forever. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm a Montessori teacher. I've been teaching Montessori for like three, 20 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I've always worked on cars with my dad. Yeah, go girl. My late husband, and it's always just been a lot of fun, kind of hobby, kind of thing, you know. But rebuilding, you know, a car and making it beautiful, taking it to a car show, it's amazingly fun. Yeah. And so, as I mentioned, my late husband, <laughs> and I find myself getting hit on and dealing with these men, and so I find it necessary. And thanks to my friend, I'm here watching you um, she's like you know cars you know and how can I make a difference mm -hmm. how can I do Montessori and educate and help empower women 
And so I'm here listening to you. Um, I would like to open my own mechanic shop and um, handy woman, you mm -hmm. know, teach them how to work in their own homes mm -hmm. and repairs there too, because I've had to deal with that because yep. I literally, you know, got, um, she was trying to hire somebody and they're like, well, I'll, I'll date you and mm -hmm. I'll fix it. I'm like, oh no, I just <laughs> want to pay. <laughs> And That's in the show, too. Yeah. Where Patty like, had to work at a shop, and a guy yeah. won't only hire her, she dated him. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I just want you to do the work. Mm -hmm. and so then I find, found myself being the plumber, being the electrician, and stepping into other roles that I'm like, I wasn't necessarily used to. Mm -hmm. So I have all these friends, and that are, all, like, like you said, that are, I'm sure you run into that, that have those same um, issues. And like I said, I find myself lately that I want to do this mm -hmm. and how do I do that and do you mentor <laughs> <laughs> so there's a few things that I would say to you based off that question is I think it's great that you want to do it and the fact that it's in your heart and you feel it means it belongs to you and that you should be doing it right so absolutely go for it and how I started was I didn't know anything about cars so I had to go back to school but I, I was taking my experiences and saying what could I teach women about how to make a better choice Right, how to make a better choice with their car, how to have a better experience. Um, so just start writing that stuff down. What are your experiences? What have you learned? Other women learn from this. You'd be surprised at what will come out. And I'm also a person who likes to break things down to like their core principles. So when I talk about cars, I think, what is the most important thing to know? So you can make the right choice. I don't talk about piston rings or even pistons or cylinders. You don't need to know that about an engine, but you need to know your engine needs air and it needs fuel and it sets it on fire. That's what makes your car go, these mini explosions, right? I talk about oil and coolant being the lifeline of your car. So it's not getting too technical and I also make it relatable. Think of your engine like a vagina. When I talk about the importance of oil changes or does your car have boogies? When I talk about needing that air filter. Um, so finding ways to make it, make it authentically you, speak from your heart about it, here's what I've learned, women, here's what I think can help you make a better decision, that's where I'll start. Um, and you'll get women that are gonna come because they're thirsty for this, right? Literally women don't come from two hours away, they don't know our credentials and if we're good, they're just like, you're women, I'm happy you're here and I wanna be here. Right, so just it's about putting yourself out there, and that's what I did. I put myself out there. My workshops weren't amazing when I first started. Um, two people would show every month. I do them. Two people would show up. One person, three people. Now they sell out. It's you have to wait months to get into one. Right, um, so don't expect it to be big and explosive. Right, stay the course. When one person shows up, you still do it. And by the way, it's why I'm so good at speaking right now. When I'm doing these videos, they're like, you're such a natural, you're amazing. I have been doing these workshops and speaking like this every day, every month, three, four years, whether it's one person or 100 people. And I bring that authenticity and that energy every time. So when, you're, when you are on TV in Good Morning America or you're in Time Magazine, like we've been, you're ready. You're already ready, right? Um, so that's what I would tell you. And join our Chicanic page. I'll meet with me afterwards. I'll give you a business card, right? There's other women out there that, you, that are doing it um, that you can maybe partner with or even talk to, right, as well. I don't want you to think like I'm the only one, right? Because it's also hard to reach me all the time. Um, but there's other resources out there for you. And it makes me think of one more thing, sorry, that I'll mention when you mentioned that. I want you ladies to know that men don't think we don't know about cars. When we take our car in, it's the, the reason that they say, well, can I talk? to your husband or, or you know your father they kind of dismiss us is not because they think we don't get it or we won't know it it's because they're afraid of us women will challenge the guy right we're gonna ask questions and they don't know how to explain it to you right and so that's why they say well can I talk to your dad or can I talk to your other they won't look at you or they'll start to get frustrated when you don't get it okay do not do not back down right like if they can't explain it to you where you understand it get out and go find a place that is going to explain it to you, or what I call finding your PCT, your primary care technician. You've earned this. This is your hard-earned money, right? If you're uncertain, go find someone that's going to help you and make you feel good about it. Um, and, and if anything, it may help your interaction. Because I know for me, I'd get up there with my wall up, and you're, you know, you're not taking advantage of me today. But I actually made a lot of poor decisions because I thought I was being taken advantage of, and I really wasn't.
right? Or I had that guard up, and then the mechanic gets their guard up. And so what I want you to know, basically, is when they get like that, or they're frustrated, or they say, talk to your dad, it's not them dismissing you, right? It's because they're scared, or they're afraid, and they don't know how to explain it to you. So, yeah, good luck, and let's talk more after. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I'll be here in. signing books. If you have other questions for me, we can go upstairs and talk more. Please join me in thanking Catrice Banks for her visit. <laughs> Thank you.